It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to another season, another year of Science on Top. We're in our ninth year in a row of doing this now. Oh and this my is, God. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> this is episode 350, Tree Fitty. Today is wow. Monday, the 17th of February, 2020. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And if you're wondering what it takes to keep a podcast going for nine long years, I can tell you. It takes a lot of hard work, a lot of tender loving care, and it takes some money. Penny and Lucas do the hard work. I give that care and attention, and that leaves you, dear listener, to pony up the cash. Just head to scienceontop.com slash donate, and from there you can sign up to become a Patreon. Now, I wonder where pony up came from. I wonder well, where that phrase came from. Back in the day, before the invention of money, they used to trade in ponies. I don't know. I'm just completely <laughs> making this up. <laughs> uh, can't believe everything you hear on Science on Top, people. But some of it you can. Lucas. Yes, hello. You may remember, back in September, we talked about a project called Mouse Light that a team at Howard Hughes Medical Institute was working on. They had just mapped 1,000 neurons uh, from a mouse brain and were aiming to map 100,000 neurons to get what they called a, quote, fuzzy view of the whole brain's wiring scheme. Well, now, another team at Howard Hughes Medical Institute has been working with Google and they've just announced that they have mapped the connectome in the central region of the brain of a fruit fly. That's only a third of the fly's brain but it means that they've worked out the precise meanderings of 25,000 neurons and their 20 million connections. And this is a really pivotal step in neuroscience, isn't it? I, I'm picturing you doing the, the Dr. Evil uh, <laughs> uh, thing with your hands. 20 when you say, million, 20 million connections. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is rather epic. Um, the, it really... I don't think, certainly not coming from that field, um, it, it's hard to appreciate just the enormity of such a project. And and as you say, it's a third of a fruit fly's brain. Mm. A fruit, fry, a fruit, <laughs> fly, a fruit <laughs> fly's fly. brain is not a big brain. It's a very no. small brain. But even with a third of its brain, We've got, as you said, over 20 million connections of 25,000 neurons um, to be mapped. And mapping is exactly what this team have done. And they've done it in a pretty short time compared to what the researchers expected to be the case. So this took over 12 years to do this mapping. Um, it cost over 40 million US dollars. It involved over 100 biologists and computer scientists and proofreaders of the neurons themselves. There's a lot of people involved in this project. I love that. And That's a job description. What do you do? I'm a proofreader of, what was it, neurons? I'm a, 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 new, a neuronal, a neuronal proofreader. Proof <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yes. So, and, the, and we'll get to them, actually, because they had an important role in terms of the way that this was um, this this project was done. But one of the things I really love about this project was it involves AI. I, I like um, I, I like seeing how AI is, is taking more and more of a role in science and many, many other things. Really, anything to do with big data, AI can help mm. enormously because it can do stuff really, really fast and it learns. So that was one of the challenges of this was training an AI. And in fact, Google got involved in this. Um, Google were involved with providing the AI that was originally designed to do um, recognition of um, uh, basically geographical things. Um, oh. So imagine Street View, um, Google Earth and Street View and so forth. 
their their AI was involved with with learning how to figure out the, the that from one one cross section one tiny ridiculously small cross section of the fruit fly's brain to the next which would be the next layer it had to figure out okay well i know that neuron was there and now looking at this new picture which is one layer up i then trace where each of the neurons that i could see in this image now are and then we do it again on the next one and then the next wow. one and then the next one so the process involved taking the it's uh, the fruit flies were harmed in the making of this research because this is a destructive Bastards. process. Uh, it did involve them basically uh, cutting up the brain. But when I say cutting up, the 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 size of these uh, these a slices really tiny is razor. mind-boggling. Yeah, it's mind-boggling. So um, the process involved effectively taking these ridiculously small slices of brain. And they're not using razors for this sort of thing, right? They're, they're basically um, shaving them off with lasers, right, as one slice at a time. So um, then they were using this incredible imaging equipment um, to image each slice and then feeding all of these slices, millions and millions of these slices, into a system which the AI could access and would process. Now, in order to train the AI, of, AI, of course, you this is where the neuronal proofreaders come in. So the neuronal proofreaders were a whole lot of people who were ver people are really good at at um, noticing differences in images. Um, computers are not as good, but once people no, people see and and are able to feed what is right to the AI. The AI can learn what the people can do very, very easily. And then it can do it just factors faster mm. than people mm. can. So once the neuronal proofreaders had proofread much of the AI's early work and fed those results back into the AI, the AI got better and better and better and better. And then in continuously reprocessing the same ones, it got to a point of no errors. Um, and that's what really took a great deal of time. Now, the incredible thing about this is despite this huge effort, this, this massive effort that they've done, um, one of the lead researchers estimated that you could do a thousand-fold larger project, such as, for example, a mouse connectome, with only about 10 times the money in only 10 years. Hmm. because of the processes that have been established in this project and, of course, the continual improvement in processing power and in improvement of AIs. That's the so, very embodiment of that uh, shoulders of giants concept. Yeah. This is the work that's been done before and now future developments on the same sort of theme are going to be that much faster and cheaper yes. and better. Yeah. That's right. It's exactly right. And and uh, if you're interested, if you feel like standing on the shoulders of giants to, to extend uh, these sorts of projects more, you can because the data is publicly available. It's free to all. Um, so anyone wanting to study this connectome uh, is able to access the data. I'm and downloading can... it right now. No, I'm not. <laughs> Do it now. <laughs> I would need more than a proofreader to make sense of it. Um, they think they'll have the entire fruit fly brain um, mapped out by 2022. So it's 2020 now. It's only two years away. This is really, really close. Um, considering every, that's only a third. It took them 12 years to get to this point. They'll do hmm. the next two thirds in only two or two or so years, uh, which is which is quite extraordinary. Um, so this one, as I say, I loved it because I love. I love neuroscience, but I also love uh, seeing what AI is doing. And I can see so much good that can come from AI, but also so much that we have to prepare for in terms of, you know, protecting, uh, well, not necessarily protecting jobs, but, but just uh, adapting our economies and the way that they oh. work to handle the impact of AI on, on jobs that humans do right now. Um, we, we need to adapt. As with all technology. Yeah. Right. I guess my 
my question with this then is where next? Because presumably having the one map is really just the one data point and you're only going to want to do that for multiple different like presumably this was many fruit flies brains that they had to d chop up to get this so well, you're going to want to have say it didn't actually say I mean, this was all one that fruit that fly that's pretty extraordinary yeah it could be uh, it didn't actually say in this in the story that i read as to how many fruit fly brains were analyzed um i, I guess one would make sense from the perspective of ensuring that you're tracing the same neurons because yeah, obviously, true. you know, every brain is going to be slightly different. There's going to be certain parts of the brain that are, you know, you know, the main structures in the brain are going to be common to all fruit flies. But, um, but the individual neurons are going to come down to experiences that have built that fruit fly's brain. Oh, I was going to say, but that's why you'd want to have another brain mapped and then another one so you can then look at the differences between the two i would say so but uh, you know with the speed the sp i mean they've only got through a third potentially of one fly's brain so far after 12 years so i guess yeah. give them a minute give them a minute <laughs> maybe they can do a maybe few a more minutes yeah some some other things that were quite interesting in reading this story was was the other the other technologies that have improved so much in a, in a relatively short period of time that made this possible. So, for example, um, uh, Ruben, one of the lead researchers, said that there's been, uh, he said, on top of the thousandfold improvement he and his team achieved since they began the Fly Connect Dome in 2008, he said there has been a one trillion fold increase in the speed of DNA sync sequencing since he did his PhD thesis in 1973. So I feel like now you're said, doing the Dr. Evil thing. One trillion fold in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and he said, so the sequencing of 158 bases of yeast RNA took him two years to do back then. That can now be done by machines in a millisecond. Wow. That's, yeah, that's pretty stunning. So just, you know, it, it sometimes can feel that the the advances we are making in, in various sciences is very slow and, oh, we should have had all of this stuff by now. But if you consider things like that, I mean, that's that's within my lifetime. Um, that's an incredible – that's that's just mind-blowing how, how fast we can do these things compared to how they used to take. Um, it is. I find that amazing. So uh, in terms of the, uh, the thickness of the cuts – so um, I mentioned before that they were basically, um, you know, slicing it. These slices, they called them slabs, which I found quite amusing because, you know, you <laughs> think of a slab as being a significant – Yeah. <laughs> yes, these slabs were 20 microns thick, which is about the width of a, an extremely fine human hair. Um, wow. So – a little bit thicker than I expected, to be honest. Um, you know, considering we're talking about a fruit fly's brain, uh, yeah. but nonetheless, yeah. Hopefully, this will help us understand the brains of larger animals, of course, uh, are better, and you get a better idea of what's actually going on in that mushy, tangled mess in there. Yeah. Do you want to hear a little bit of the process of how they they actually scan them? Do I ever? Yes. This is very, very cool. It's quite, it's a bit technical, but it's very, very cool. He said, so, uh, so I'm just reading directly from the story here. A focused ion beam, <laughs> this already, I'm thinking of Star Trek, right? Yep. A focused ion beam <laughs> milling, uh, milling combined with scanning electron my, my, uh, here we go, microscopy, a beam of gallium ions blasts off surface atoms Microscope takes an image of what's revealed beneath, and the beam mills off another two nanometers um, over and over. So basically, it's you know it's very destructive. We're not putting this back together afterwards. Uh, eventually, the actual chunk of brain is gone. <laughs> but from that chunk of brain, we have approximately 26 terabytes of image data. Oh, 26 million photos. Um, the entire fruit fly brain would amount to approximately 100 terabytes. So there you go. So there you go. If you want to know what industry to invest your money in, I think the hard drive industry is <laughs> going to start taking off, especially when you look at, like we've talked before about, you know, all the data collected by the Large Hadron Collider and by all these astronomy projects that we've got going on. Data storage is big industry. It's the way. And AI. 
Yeah, the, yeah. the the Google involved I mentioned before, I was slightly uh, I got that slightly wrong. It wasn't the uh, it wasn't the pattern matching stuff in things like uh, Google Earth and so forth. It was actually the face identification technology that they use for self driving cars. That was the genesis of this technology. So they had to teach it to recognise these images and figure out what was what. So yeah, it started with uh, with self driving cars. Self driving cars. You never know what. Yeah. You never know what your technology is going to spawn into. It's extraordinary. And like I said, hopefully we'll get a lot more answers from that uh, when it comes to bigger animals and bigger brains. So that was a story from right now. But our next story, we're going back in time to a much quieter, more peaceful time about (laughs) two billion years ago. Probably on a Thursday. These sorts of things always happen on a Thursday. (laughs) And we're in Western Australia, in what's now a desert, but back then would have been covered in a kilometre thick glacier. And suddenly, a massive meteorite smacks into the ice and the rock beneath it. And it leaves a crater 70 kilometres wide. To put that in perspective, if you lined up 1,500 blue whales nose to tail... You'd only get from the centre to the edge of that crater. And you'd but kill a lot of whales. Many Olympic, how many Olympic swimming pools? Right. So many Olympic swimming pools. About <laughs> 750 if I were to do that math in my head. How many Manhattan Islands is it? Oh, don't get me started on <laughs> <laughs> And you can just leave. Uh, oh, what's the, there's always a small country that they uh, refer to. Belgium, yeah. I think. They Luxembourg. Yeah. Luxembourg. Luxembourg, that's, that's, a, that's a good yeah. one. Anyway, I like this story for two reasons. One, um, because of how they found out, and two, because of what it might mean. So this is um, a place in Western Australia called Yarrabubba, and there's not much there. Yarrabubba. Okay, I did hear you yep. right. <laughs> yep, yep, you did hear me right, Yarrabubba. Um, and there's not much there now, so there's some granite, which is a reasonably ordinary kind of rock. Um but the story about what's there is quite interesting because if you take do a geophysical survey of the area, there's some really clear signs of some kind of anomaly or something that is just not normal that you would expect. And this has been taken to be the signs of an impact crater. So even though this happened 2 billion years ago and a lot of erosion can happen in 2 billion years, there's always been something a bit strange about that area. The other thing that's been found in the area, and this is what's recently been dated, is some granite. Now, granite is what we call an igneous rock. It's one that forms from lava or magma that cools underneath the surface, so it cools really slowly. So this one has formed columns, which shows that it's cooled. So you might have seen um, basalt formations like the Devil's Causeway, I think, in Ireland or the organ pipes in Melbourne, where you get these columns of rock. Because as things cool, they contract and you get these columns forming. But if you look at this, yeah, this particular granite, it's got these long spidery lines. So it's like it's been shattered. So basically, there's a couple of ways that rock can act like that. It could be a nuclear bomb. It could be a meteorite strike. Now, given the age of the rock, and a lot of rocks in Western Australia are extremely old, keep it simple, stupid, suggests it was a meteorite strike. So it left a huge crater, which is all of the stuff that you'd expect to see on the surface of an impact crater has been eroded away in the last 2 billion years. And what's left is this shattered granite. So it was a massive strike. The reason that we can say um, the age of the crater is by zircon crystals. So what happens with um, minerals like or uranium atoms is over time they decay. So you might have heard of the half-life of uranium. And uranium, um, it decays at a predictable rate. So... When uranium, when a rock crystallizes or forms in these zircon, um, these crystals form, you can sort of look at the ratio of uranium and lead. And because uranium decays to lead, you can say, oh, if there's this much uranium and this much lead 
it's been decaying for, you know, so many billion years. But something like a, um, a meteorite strike can actually reset that clock. So because zircon crystals are really tough, like they survive when lava melts, um, they are really good at measuring time because they also contain uranium. But when the meteorite hit, it was strong enough to, sh the impact was strong enough to actually shatter these zircon crystals and get rid of the lead. So essentially, you've reset that zircon crystal clock to when the asteroid hit, which was 2.29 or so billion years ago, or 2.229 billion years ago. And they've given us a nice tight plus or minus of a mere 5 million years. Which, Which given is that actually it's quite tight. Billion, that's like, amazingly you know, precise. Like yeah. I'm going to say that's precise, which I always find funny. This actually <laughs> sent me on a rabbit hole of looking for T-shirts that I remembered that were for sale when I did geology with schist happens on, but that's another story. <laughs> anyway, but the reason that, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, another impact crater, great. It's like it's not a surprise that a meteorite hit 2.2 or 2.29 billion years ago. But why this one is interesting, because this seems to, and this is not uncontroversial, it seems to coincide with the end of a snowball earth event. So the most famous snowball earth event is probably the one that ended just before the Cambrian explosion of life, sort of 600 million years ago. But this was another one where the entire globe we think was covered in glaciers. So essentially, the name gives you an idea of what it might have been like. The Earth was like a snowball. So basically, so seems a snowball Earth is just like an ice age sort of thing, is that? Yeah, but it's everything. Right, okay. So for the ice age, maybe the glaciers were down, you know, quite low. For a snowball, it's everywhere. Ice at the equator. Okay, gotcha. And the poles and everywhere in between. Just ice. Doesn't and sound fun. And it just fun. seems, doesn't sound fun, but it does seem that, seems like this meteorite hit, and the snowball earth ended. So the theory is perhaps as it hit, it vaporized, it hit a glacier. It vaporized a huge amount of water into the atmosphere, which caused greenhouse gas. Water vapor ah. is a really great greenhouse gas. And perhaps it ended this snowball earth. Um, it's a thought experiment. So we can't really tell if there was a glacier there 2 billion years ago considering that um, there's been so much erosion. Yeah. And what we're looking yeah. at is stuff that was deep in the crust. But I just think it's fascinating. And I think it's – I really like that we can find these kind of ancient structures by looking at geophysical anomalies. I love that you go to the rocks and you see the macro features, the shattering. I love that you go deep inside the rock and you look at these tiny little zircon crystals – to get the radio clock, you know, the, the um, radioactive clock. And I love that we can link it to some massive events in Earth history. So, yeah. I, story I, has everything. The story has everything and it's all about rocks, which I feel like <laughs> you don't often get a sexy rock story, but this is one. And it's Australian too, which I do love. Yeah. Well, Australia has the sexiest rock stories, let's be honest. It does. It does. <laughs> uh, no, That's like something Trump would say. We wow. the sexiest rock you stories. To, you went and ruined it. You had to go yeah, and ruin like, it. I mean... It was pure and innocent, Lucas. <laughs> yeah. Here I am making Australian geology great again, and you have to... Yeah. Go <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Make rocks great again. <laughs> uh, rocks were never not great. So... Well. Jack's on you. <laughs> No, that's, like I said, that's a story that's got everything. And, um, yeah, who knows? I would have thought that, I mean, that snowball earth would have been ended by volcanic activity or something, but maybe it could have been a bit of both. I don't know. Look, my gut feeling is something that ended two billion years ago, we're probably never going to stop. Yeah. Wondering. Yeah. Oh, well, not with that attitude. <laughs> I know. That's probably why I'm a, not a scientist. <laughs> I'm like, whatever, we'll never Never know. stop asking questions, Penny. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of the unknown, uh, let's move on to Parkinson's disease now, which affects more than 10 million people worldwide, and yet we know so little about it. We can't cure it, 
and we don't even know what causes it. But we do know that a buildup of a protein, alpha-synuclein, worsens the disease and accelerates that degeneration. But now, Penny, researchers in the US have developed a compound that can target and reduce the levels of that protein, right? Yeah, and it's really interesting. So Parkinson's is a degenerative disease, so the symptoms develop slowly over time. I think the ones that people are probably most familiar with are tremors, slow moving, difficulty walking. But when the disease progresses, it can actually, you know, inhibit your ability to swallow or and blink. things like that. So it's pretty, yeah. um, pretty grim. But this protein alpha synuclein, it does seem to be linked to Parkinson's. It, it accumulates in an abnormal form in the brain cells, as Ed said, and it causes degeneration. But because it, has, it doesn't have a fixed structure, it keeps on changing its shape. And it's really difficult to drug, for drugs to target because a lot of drugs kind of, you know, they fit onto things that they're targeting or to receptors on the things yeah, that they're targeting. Yeah, that lock and key. Mechanism. Lock and key kind of model. So the theory is that if high levels of the protein in the brain speed up degeneration, if you can find a way to stop this protein being produced so much that could help to treat the disease. So instead of trying to match the protein itself, the idea is that it could actually target the messenger RNA that codes for this protein. And the way that that works is inside our cells, you know, we have our DNA, which is the instructions for all the proteins that our body make. And that's inside a part of the cell called the nucleus. But the messenger RNA is basically what its name is. It's a copy of a, a nucleic acid that copies along the desired bit of DNA and goes outside the nucleus and then goes to a structure called a ribosome where the protein is made. So this is quite, this is really clever because instead of targeting the actual protein that's um, the product of this, it targets that messenger RNA. So the protein wouldn't get made in the first place. So it doesn't matter that it's changing its shape and being a pain because you can just stop it, it building up it by preventing its... It doesn't happen structure. at all, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this new compound um, can help prevent cells making like the misfolded form of the protein. So it could be really um, a great treatment, especially for people in the early stages of, of the disease. So I just thought that was um, a bit of good news. Absolutely. But, I yeah. wonder, like I said, there's so many unknowns for this. Like, does that mm. protein, is it only ever a bad thing or is it also a good thing? And by stopping its production, we could be hindering other things. But I guess the real problem is when it's misformed, isn't it? That's that misformed, fold goes yeah, wrong. rather than the way it's meant to be formed. So perhaps, I mean, I, I don't know how drugs work. I wish we had one of our experts but you know maybe it's possible to regulate the dosage to just reduce the production enough to slow it down you know, considerably slow yeah. it down yeah i don't know it'll be interesting either way who knows it's actually some good to have some good news in parkinson's because uh, i feel like it's one of those things where we're constantly hearing about potential uh mm. stepping stones on the way to a cure or something and then they fall flat it's a bit like alzheimer's yeah. and that sort of thing where yeah we're never quite and the idea is that progress. yeah maybe this concept of targeting the rna mm. might even help because there's alzheimer's i think has similar kinds of proteins that are yes. difficult to treat with drugs so yeah all those um brain degenerative diseases are just very unpleasant for everybody you know without question yeah. Without question. All right. Well, let's finish up talking about Beetlejuice, the star, not the Michael Keaton character. Although Michael Keaton is a star, but not the sort of star we're talking about. I'll do all that again. Lucas, <laughs> let's talk about Betelgeuse, the reddish-orange star in the constellation of Orion. Usually one of the top ten brightest stars in the night sky it's been dimming over the last few months, and this has sent a lot of media outlets to speculate that we may be about to see one of the brightest supernovae in more than a thousand years. CNN, for example, ran with the headline, A giant red star is acting weird, and scientists think it may be about to explode. 
So Lucas, I guess the obvious question is, is it about to explode and why? Uh, no, uh, un- highly unlikely. That it, <laughs> that it's um, and, and I don't know who the scientists were that were being quoted, but but certainly all of the scientists who, who study stars, astrophysicists uh, who, who have commented on this that I've found uh, are all pretty much singing from the same hymn book, which is, this is interesting because it's, um, it's not something that we've seen uh, before. We haven't seen Betelgeuse dim to this extent this quickly before. However, there are several quite reasonable explanations as to why this could have happened. And as it happens, it is now starting to brighten up again anyway. So a couple of quick things about Betelgeuse itself. It's big. It's freaking huge. It's a red supergiant. It's, it's a, a star that's, that's, that has a huge amount of mass. It's lived its life hard and fast. Um, it is nearing the end of its life, and we know it will eventually go supernova. When it goes supernova is a little bit unknown, but it is estimated it should be sometime within the next 100,000 years or so. Um, it could go at any moment. That's Probably definitely on a Thursday. It's <laughs> quite possibly on a Thursday. Um, it could go any moment. In fact, it could already have gone because it's about 650 light years away from us. It may have already happened and mm. we won't know until um, the light reaches us or stops reaching us or however, which way you, you put it. However, when it does go, it'll be pretty impressive because um, a star this big when it goes supernova is anticipated to be roughly as bright as the full moon in our sky. Now, for a point of light that's about as bright as the full moon in our sky, it will be easily visible during daylight. Um, when this wow. Happens. And, and at night, of course, it will be, well, as bright as the full moon, which will be really cool. I would love if oh, this yeah. star would go. I think everyone I know who's interested in astronomy would love for Betelgeuse to go kabloom. <laughs> but in our it is probably not going to happen. We are owed by the way, just as an aside, we are owed a supernova because yeah. we are quite overdue for how for a supernova to occur in our part of the galaxy based on how often we, we know that they go on average. But averages are a painful thing. Statistics <laughs> don't work evenly. They sometimes come in lumpy chunks. And um, in this case, we're, we're quite overdue for a visible supernova in our, in our neck of the woods. Um, and it could be a completely different star that we're not expecting. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do know Betelgeuse will go at some point in time. Now, what's going on right now? So Betelgeuse also has a very interesting characteristic in that it is the only other star which we've been able to directly image. We can directly image the surface of Betelgeuse from here. It's that freaking big. So how big is it, I hear you ask? How big is it? It's really big. Oh. If we were to put it where our sun is, it would be basically, well, let's just put it this way. Jupiter would kind of be grazing the edges of Betelgeuse Holy if it was smokes. where our sun is. So all of the inner rocky planets would be inside uh, Betelgeuse if it was there. And, yeah, things would be somewhat haphazard, uh, as you would imagine. Now, of course, our sun will eventually turn into a red giant, but it won't be a red supergiant. A red supergiant is, as the name sort of indicates, much, much larger than a red giant uh, because it starts as a bigger star. So um, so that's kind of the, uh, you know, the, the interesting things about Betelgeuse and the fact that we've we have and are able to directly image its surface means we can actually see sunspots on the surface of Betelgeuse from no. here. Yes. 650 and so cool. light years away. Right. And it's just so freaking big. So the fact that we can see sunspots is very interesting on in terms of the, um, the dimming and brightening of Betelgeuse. So Betelgeuse is known to be a variable star. It does 
change its brightness. In fact, the Australian Aboriginals knew that it changed its brightness, and part of the calendar was actually based on one of the very long cycles of Betelgeuse, which was something like 11 years, if I remember correctly. So um, they they did notice that over long periods of time, Betelgeuse would uh, dim and then and then take a period of years to brighten again in in the in the sky. So it's it's long known to have been a variable star. Now it has several different periods of brightening and dimming. And one of the explanations about its recent dimming is actually that two of these dimming cycles happen to be occurring at the same time. Two dimming cycles that are thought to have different causes. Uh-huh. Um, there are several dimming cycles, as I mentioned, with, uh, with Betelgeuse. One of them is in the realm of about 400 days. So every 400 days it has a dimming cycle. But there's other there's other ones, like, for example, that go out to over 2,000 days long. And there's another one that's only just a few months long. So it has been calculated by some that it does look like uh, at least two of these periods are now overlapping. And yeah. that is the easiest explanation of what's going on. Um, yeah. So one of them might be, for example, that – we have a particularly low incidence of sunspots right now. Sunspots on Betelgeuse are hot. Hotter equals brighter, and therefore our absolute magnitude will increase when it has sunspots. If you look at photos or images of the surface of Betelgeuse, you can actually see great big white areas on the star, which are these massive sunspots. And when we say massive, uh, well bigger than our sun are the sunspots on Betelgeuse. Um, Betelgeuse has immense convective currents it, it it's it's thought that these these currents um and the, these uh the, these very very deep um uh plumes of of plasma uh that move around on the in 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 this convection current uh, uh situation of betelgeuse are are you know the structure is absolutely enormous so if it's having a slow period of sunspots right now it would appear a little bit dimmer combined with one of these other cycles that might have some relationship to the fact that it's puffing off atmosphere at a very fast rate the solar winds coming from betelgeuse would be extreme because it is towards the end of its life so it's it's, it's shedding mass very very quickly i was going to say that um, it, I, i've seen some of the photos and it looks like it's not a sphere anymore it's got this bulge coming out to one side sort of thing yes. so is that just atmosphere is just being flung off or something so it has enormous enormous uh, coronal mass ejections that put you know, our whole solar system to shame, Um, you know, massive coronal mass ejections. It's also puffing off its atmosphere constantly. And we anticipate it probably is creating dust clouds around it as well, which could also get in the way of the star and reduce its luminosity. So all of these things put together would tend to indicate that whilst Betelgeuse is, as it has always been, an incredible star that's very, very interesting because of what's going on, it's probably not about to explode. I'm sorry. But could the dimming be explained by an alien Dyson sphere constructed around it? <laughs> and, <laughs> I've heard that can uh, happen. So, uh, so yeah, it's not. Um, it's not, not as uh, it's not as much of a uh, it's it's not as much of a um, a mystery as Tabby Star because as I mentioned we can directly yeah. image its surface so if there was a, a structure in between us and it uh, we might even see a silhouette that'd be really cool yes but not that so okay well we will uh, keep an eye on it and see if anything develops from that but as you say it just sounds like a We'll watch, we'll watch this story for the next 100,000 years and let you know. <laughs> well, yeah. If it explodes, we'll let you know. Uh, if, yeah. if we yeah. find out, because obviously it may have already exploded and we won't know for another 650 years. So, yeah. If it just went just then, yeah. yeah. Could have yeah gone what if it exploded 650 recording. years ago? It would be awesome. That's Wouldn't true. It be cool? Yeah. Well, another reason to keep looking up and we'll see what <laughs> happens. And on that note... That's our show. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 350. And if you go to scienceontop.com slash donate, you can sign up to Patreon and help us pay the bills. Thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week 
putting science on the top of the agenda. Join us then. One hundred twenty miles. That's how far Katherine Johnson drove to school just to get a high school diploma. Fifteen. That's how old Katherine Johnson was when she began her freshman year of college. Twenty. That's how old Katherine Johnson was when she became the first African American female to attend West Virginia's grad school. Two thousand steps. That's how far the colored bathrooms were from Katherine Johnson's office. 116 miles. That's how far up the first American in space flew because of human computers like Catherine. 26 academic papers, five honorary degrees, four great-grandchildren, one medal of freedom. 98. That's how young NASA mathematician Catherine Johnson is today. And she wanted to share a message to the young women of the world. From a young age, she loved math and always wanted to count. Now, 